Okay, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Drupal NYC meetup uh, for March 2021. Uh, good to have you all. Thanks for joining. So first, a uh, little housekeeping. Um, please, uh, you know, turn on that video camera if you uh, feel like joining uh, the rest of us here, but uh, it's also perfectly acceptable to, to leave that off if, you know, you don't want to, um, but it's always good to see your face. Um, and uh, oftentimes folks will turn off their camera during a presentation. Um, it, it's really up to you. So uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Uh, that'll really help with, um, you know, the background noise and feedback. And uh, please don't use the chat feature of Zoom. We really want you to use Drupal NYC Slack. Uh, the link there is drupalnyc.org slash Slack. And that has the details for how to join. Um, and the big reason for that is uh, because then your interaction, uh, you know, doesn't, if you use Zoom, it doesn't last beyond this meetup. And we'd love, you know, to, to have that record and to, you know, hopefully spur some more interactions and uh, conversations among everyone here. Um, and in Drupal NYC Slack, the meetup channel is the place to, to chat during the meetup um, so that we're not flooding the community channel with uh, uh, all the real-time communications we might have, sharing links and whatnot. Okay, um, so we've got three great talks uh, slated for tonight. Um, Richard's gonna talk about avoiding agency nightmares when relaunching your website. Then David's gonna talk about, uh, gonna do a 10 minute Drupal web performance makeover. And then Diego's going to talk about building a high availability environment for Drupal with Microsoft Azure. Very cool. Okay, so these fine people were involved in the uh, organization of this meetup. Um, and as always, based on the work of the past organizers and the Drupal NYC board, and uh, we would love your help. Um, so if you're interested in participating in, you know, planning these, you don't even have to attend the, the meetup. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it does take some time to coordinate with all the speakers and get people scheduled and answer questions, um, as well as do the marketing uh, and, and MC. So we'd love to, to have some helping hands. Uh, it's, it's low commitment. You can just, you know, try it out one time, see if it works well for you. And uh, yeah, we'd love to have you. So meetup-organize is the channel on Drupal NYC Slack. Uh, where you can find the organizers. Um, otherwise, uh, you can email feedback at drupalnyc.org. And you can connect with us on Twitter, hashtag DrupalNYC. And DrupalNYC is our handle there. And uh, as always, on Slack. Uh, please do support the Drupal Association. Uh, Drupal NYC is the nonprofit uh, in the New York area, but Drupal, the Drupal Association is the nonprofit about all things Drupal globally, and um, they do some great things. Uh, it's a really low commitment to become a member, and uh, you support a lot of infrastructure on Drupal.org, uh, as well as uh, investment in the open source project and various tools that support it. OK, lots of upcoming events. So uh, MidCamp, uh, usually in Chicago, uh, but online, is March 24 to 27. Uh, Drupal Fest is the whole month of April. Um, and you can read more about that uh, if you Google it. <laughs> um, but basically, it's uh, it's a month of celebrating the birthday of Drupal, uh, and so there will be lots of events um, and things to participate in, including DrupalCon North America, April twelve to sixteen, and uh, Decouple Days, July fourteen to fifteen. That's usually in New York, but all of these things are online. Um, and their call for papers is open through April 1st. No joke. All right. So other ways we would love your help is organizing uh, Drupal Camp NYC 2021. Um, it can be very low time commitment, uh, but we do need lots of hands to make light work. Um, so you can join the Camp Organize channel on Drupal NYC Slack or email camp-volunteer at drupalnyc.org. We have lots of roles uh, to fill. Um, and you don't have to have any Drupal experience uh, to participate as an organizer. You don't even have to attend the event. So why not? Good way to get involved. Uh, okay, so another event uh, we have coming up. Um, we have started, we're starting a Drupal NYC Lunch and Learns. So uh, we're taking some of our time from our evening meetups and reallocating it uh, to uh, noon o'clock uh, Eastern time uh, hour 
uh, to learn something on company time. Um, so uh, if you want to hear more about those, be sure to join our newsletter. Uh, and if somebody could uh, type this into the, uh, the Slack, that'd be very, very handy. It's uh, bit.ly slash DNYC dash mailing dash lists. Uh, we always announce our meetups and now our lunch and learns uh, through that newsletter first and with all the detail. Um, so you don't have to click through it anywhere else to find it. Um, so that's how we recommend folks uh, hear about our events. Now our events cannot happen without speakers. So we're very thankful for our speakers and uh, we need more. Uh, we're always in need of speakers. Uh, you can talk about anything. It can be Drupal-y, non um, just something that would be of general interest to the group. Um, beginner, advanced, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, and if you need help figuring out a topic to speak on, that's okay. Get in touch and we'll, we'll find something that makes sense for you. Um, so you can contact an organizer or email speak at drupalnyc.org. Uh, and in particular, we do not have a speaker lined up for our inaugural lunch and learn um, on March 16th. So uh, that could be you. Okay, so here's my adorable daughter from yesterday. Um, Ramona wants to know who is hiring and also uh, who's looking for a job. So if you are hiring or looking for a job, you can unmute yourself and uh, say a little bit about what you're looking for. Potentially hiring, and may want to pick your bone, your brain a little bit, and they get the they get the bid, get the job. Um, anyone who knows e EDI with AS two, <clears throat> EDI is kind of um, <clears throat> in the um, API before APIs existed, and AS two is the messaging system. It's kind of like JSON without the carrots and uh, tags. It's kind of like cross between um. JSON and a CSV is the best way to uh, put that in there. But if anyone knows has, has any experience whatsoever, just contact me, and then I'll put that into um, into Slack. Thanks, Scott. Anybody else? Hi, hey everyone. My name's Jed. Oh, go ahead, Amy June. Okay. Um, I work with Canopy Studios. K A N O P I. Um, we're 100% remote. Um, we're looking for Drupal developers and Drupal tech leads and accounting and WordPress and um, project managers and specifically UX and designers right now. We always have lots of clients. We're never short of work. That's why we're always hiring. Um, and if you want more information, you can ping me, um, but it's Canopy if um, you wanna look it up online, Canopy slash careers. Thanks. You can go ahead, Jed. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm. Our team's looking to add somebody to help us with metrics and analytics. Uh, but the role it wouldn't be about report making. We have that covered, or, or social media management. We're looking for somebody that like really understands Tag Manager uh, and would be interested in like developing programs. You know, looking at a program and thinking about best ways to measure it, best ways to collect a tag manager, Google Analytics 4, stuff like that. So if uh, you know anybody like that, please let me know. Also, if you know what to call that position, uh, you know, I'm uh, <laughs> open to tips too, because we're writing the post and I'm not quite sure. Thanks. Always tricky. Anyone else with a, a job to offer or looking for a job or work? Going once? going twice not sold okay all right so there are a uh, few enough few enough of us <laughs> that uh, we can just go around and introduce ourselves um, if you want and uh, maybe I'll call on folks and uh, you can introduce yourself um, or you can say nothing and pass um, so I'll start I'm JD I'm a freelance Drupal developer and uh, I'm usually based in Jersey City but uh, for a few weeks, I am hanging out with the in-laws down in Florida. Um, we have not been able to see for over a year due to COVID, um, but they're all vaccinated now, uh, which makes a huge difference. Um, so that's kind of what I'm what I'm up to down here. Doing lots of work though, lots of work. <laughs> um, Diego, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Hi, hi everyone. Nice to meet you. I am Diego Tejera from Panama. Um, I'm actually living in New York. 
uh, as David. Um, so with 85 degrees here, I know you guys are in the middle of the winter, so I'm sorry for you. Um, so um, I'm one of the speakers today. Um, and I, I am the CEO, CTO uh, at a company, an agency called Rootstack. Uh, we are based here in Panama, and we also have offices in, in Colombia and some remote guys all over Latin America. And we work a lot with, with companies uh, on our region and also with agencies on the U.S. and Canada. That's Great, thank nice you. Oh, sorry, did I cut you off? No, that's it. Perfect. David, you want to say hello? Sure. Hi, I'm David. I'm in Peru at the moment, though I was born in India and have lived in Australia most of my life. And uh, great to have the opportunity to speak today. Awesome. Thanks, David. All right. Uh, Michael, you want to say hello? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Michael. Um, um, yeah, I, I work on some Drupal 7 websites, but I don't really know anything about Drupal 8 or 9. It's a huge leap, and I'm trying to, um, you know, I've been talking to Doug about getting into the CWA program. Ready? Excellent. Ian. Hi, guys. Ian Finley, living in Princeton, New Jersey, originally from Ireland, spent two years in Slovakia. I'm very confused. I missed all of Drupal 8. Um, trying to get back into, uh, into Drupal. We'll eventually be looking for work when I, when I figure out what, what I can do in Drupal. Looking for, interested in back end stuff. Nice. Richard. Yeah. Hi, Richard. Um, I live in Flushing. Um, I'm currently project manager web development for a nonprofit here in NYC and um, looking forward to sharing my thoughts on agency work. Fantastic. Amy June. I'm Amy June. I work in the community, but Canopy pays for my time. Um, I help out at New York City Camp. And again, I want to invite everyone to reach out for volunteering and that sort of thing. I'm in San Francisco and um, outside of San Francisco, and it's bright blue skies and about 70 degrees. So nice. Neil? Hi, uh, I'm Neil Drum. I work at the Drupal Association, helping build Drupal.org. Uh, and I am up in the village of Catskill. Nice. Jen? Oh, we're not hearing you. Hey, everyone. I'm Jed. I've uh, been working on Drupal for quite a while now. I'm a back end engineer and work in the healthcare industry. We do publishing in healthcare, uh, but I work on the product level, which is mainly uh, distribution and integration of our content into other systems. And I'm in New York City. Thanks, Jen. Ralph. Hi, I'm Ralph. Uh, I'm in content strategy and I'm from Nuremberg, Germany. Thanks, Ralph. All right, Kim, you're up. Yeah, my name is Kim Kubali. I'm also in New York City, and I work at the UN. Great. And Doug. Oh, we're not hearing you, Doug. All right, we'll, we'll come back. Mandy, do you want to say hello? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I live in New York City and uh, I've been attending Drupal Meetup for many years. Um, I worked with Drupal 7 for many years and then um, like to learn Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 and uh, migration and everything. Great. Thanks, Mandy. And uh, Tondra Lair, did I, get, did I say that right? I was waiting on it, but you did. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> so I'm Tom Delaire. I'm from Athens, Georgia. Um, I'm pretty new to Drupal, a little over a year, but I was a software developer for like 20 years before that. Um, so just here to learn about 
going from Drupal 7 to 8 because we have an old Drupal 7 site. Um, I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. Great. Welcome. Scott. I am Scott Walpo. I'm in Astoria, New York, and I've been doing Drupal for a while. And my the management tool, which, which is Drupal managing a MongoDB instance and using Drupal for an API bridge, other things, is about to launch into beta. And once I do that, I'll be looking for other people who want to do sweat equity. But um, that's what I've been focusing on for the last, during this pandemic, it's almost ready to launch. But I also build complex sites with Drupal, um, especially looking towards workflow. And that's mostly what I do. Thanks, Scott. Francis, are you there? All right, how about Sandra? Hi, um, my name's Sandra. I just, I've worked a little bit with Drupal. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks Sandra. Oh, great. I um, took one class with Drupal and it was really interested. And during the pandemic, I sort of looking for something else to do with my time and maybe you know, get a little bit more involved with it and find a way that I can make some extra money. So I'm not sure if I'm in the right place, but I hope I am. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, this, this meetup is for everyone, regardless of their uh, Drupal experience and a good place to learn and ask questions. So welcome. Uh, Danny. Or we will try Laura. Hi, sure. Um, I'm Laura. I'm in the Jersey suburbs of New York City. I am a higher ed with, uh, Drupal site owner. Um, so always looking for interesting and new things to do and um, uh, any insights on people who've migrated to nine. Great. And is it Quinn? or we'll try Hussein. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Hussein. I live in the Toronto area in Canada and uh, uh, I work as a, a kind of like a director of Drupal services for Accelerant. And um, yeah, I've, I've been in this uh, meetup group for a while and yeah, love to be here. Fantastic, thanks Hussein. Okay, did I miss anybody? If I did, unmute yourself, say hello. <laughs> going once, going twice. Doug's, Doug is back. Oh, Doug. Okay, no audio. Hi, Doug. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with the visual. All right. Thanks, everyone, for introducing yourselves. Um, so we're going to move on to our first talk. Um, so Richard's going to talk about avoiding agency nightmares when relaunching your website. So over to you, Richard. I will stop my sharing. It'd be nice if I unmuted myself. <laughs> Can you guys see my screen? Yep, looking good. All right, perfect. Um, so um, a little bit about me, uh, I've been in this space, the IT development space for a really long time. I worked with a lot of nonprofits, a lot of for-profit companies. Um, right now, my main focus is a lot of nonprofits and then I, I do a lot of stuff with the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, we recently launched our website about two weeks ago. And in this process, we, we learned a lot about ourselves. We learned a lot about how to approach our relationship with the agency and how to kind of not deal with a lot of bumps and hurdles that many people may face moving from an environment on Drupal 7 to an environment of Drupal 8 like we did. Um, because our Drupal 7 environment was so convoluted we made the conscious decision to not move over any 
content in terms of migrating. Um, we decided to take a kind of destroy and rebuild approach because when we looked at the content itself, uh, we had upwards of 50 to 60,000 redirects in there. We had pages that were never um, indexed properly. We, it was really, really messy. So we took this opportunity to kind of rethink our strategy as a whole from site architecture to um, SEO best practices to really considering our, our, our new environment to be what we quote unquote pristine, right? That being said, why do we wanna do it, right? Obviously Drupal 7 is coming to its end of life and we wanted an environment that did a couple of things. We are currently housing nine web properties in total. And we wanted a one basic foundation code base that we can use across the board to basically um, use Pantheon's like Git flow basically to be able to use this one code base across all nine web properties because prior to this, our code bases were staggered. So our US main global website, if you will, contain one base code and then all other international properties had a totally different base code that didn't really match. So we decided to kind of take a step back and create a brand new environment that kind of housed this one collective piece and pick and choose these paragraph types that we can reuse for different parts of the website. Um, with focuses on organic SEO, best practice SEO, um, accessibility and multilingual support. And if you guys have any questions, please stop me. I kind of don't want this to be like just me uh, yapping away because I, I get very carried away, so. Now, when we started this process, um, we used a couple of different things to kind of decide who is managing what, right? Obviously, I have a boss, my boss has a boss, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we needed to define who was the kind of shot caller, if you will, for the website. That just ended up being me. Um, so I was able to kind of dictate what the flow and balance was between the agency and then our side of the business. Um, the second point is really like around the balance between you and the agency, right? I, I'm a firm believer in you hired an agency because of the expertise, but you can't be afraid to ask the question of why, um, regardless of who it is and how much they talk about something and it seems right, sometimes you can just ask why. Um, I find that a lot of the times when we get quotes they're, they're very, uh, uh, the spectrum varies. And if you ask why or ask for more details, it magically lowers, right? Um, also finding that within the same vein, a lot of agencies seem to nickel and dime you for things that you would assume would be kind of built into their system and their logic. Um, and within that role is kind of knowing when to stop. Like you can over develop, you can over design, you can overthink your website. And at a certain point, you kind of just have to let it go. Um, so looking at the agency, um, budget is always kind of the biggest piece, right? So when, when you're talking about your budget and you tell an agency, this is our budget and they give you this SOW and RFP saying, this is gonna cost you X amount. Um, I always seem to kind of buffer it between 20 and like 10 to 20% past the point that you feel comfortable telling the agency, right? So if your budget was $200,000, you know, I would tell the agency 175. Um, only because that kind of allows for this extra nickel and diming or this extra kind of functionality that you didn't think about when you were building it, but 
while you're seeing it build and you're seeing kind of these components come to life, you may think that, oh, it'd be nice if it also did this extra piece. And that kind of allows for that buffer. Um, and you'll feel like you're not kind of overextending yourself or trying to find money in the budget to do these extra pieces that while initially didn't feel like you needed them, once you see it in place, you're like, oh, if we can do this, then it would alleviate X, Y, Z moving forward. Um, one of the things that came up during our kind of revisit and revision of the site was this notion of bugs versus updates. Um, I come from a freelance environment so knowing that and how people work differently, um, I personally never charged for bugs um, because I felt like I caused the bugs. That's why they're bugs, um, as opposed to like enhancements or updates that you realize that you want something that was built appropriately and you want something on top of that. Um, that's one of the things that we had to really define early on. Um, and I feel like that's something that should be kind of addressed in the beginning because then it kind of you don't have this 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 open to conversations later on determining who's paying for what um another piece that that falls within this whole realm is like no matter how beautiful you build the site no matter how fast you build the site if you put it on a hosting environment that you're paying three dollars for you're gonna get what you get right um so part of your package in kind of moving from Drupal 7 or moving just from a, a website to another, really figure out what your hosting environment looks like. Um, you know, do you need load balancing? Do you need it to be, you know, for some reason behind HTTPS 2 or something just because it's new? Whatever it is, just consider that part of your overall scheme of budgeting for your new website. Um, Launching is also essential um, because I come from this space, like I, I tend to launch things really early in the morning. So we ended up launching our site on a Sunday night at like three o'clock in the morning. Um, and that was based on looking at our analytics and determining that the bulk of our audience doesn't go on at that time. So we weren't getting donations, we weren't getting a lot of people just visiting the site during this specific time frame. So we decided to aim for that specific time frame, even though we weren't looking at any downtime because of the way that Pantheon is set up. Um, last part was really kind of just bugs and maintenance, and that goes with kind of the bugs and updates, right? Um, most agencies will give you some kind of buffer period after your launch to kind of figure out. Um, what they should be fixing post-launch. Uh, our agency was really great in kind of hand-holding that process even after launch. Even now, things we find, we can just put in our JIRA board for them and they can go and work on it and then kind of move up the, uh, the process, uh, you know, just through the Git process of Pantheon. Um, that's about it for me. Unless you have specific questions on uh, how we address certain issues, or if you're thinking about migrating from seven to eight, um, any questions that I can answer based on what we went through, that I'd be glad to answer. Thanks, Richard. So questions for Richard. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, when you said you didn't migrate the, the content, no data migration, right? No. So there was no issue between seven and eight with the way the records are structured in Drupal? Um, so the question is twofold. It would have taken a lot more work to reorganize and restructure the data from seven to eight. Um, but because our data was so convoluted to begin with, it just made more sense to abandon the current structure on seven because we were already going to reorganize the website in its entirety. So okay. from site architecture to everything was pretty much new. Okay, I guess I missed that part. I thought you like sort of moved to triple eight, but I don't know. I guess I missed that. I was like, how did you do that? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We, we, we built everything 
on Drupal 8 by hand. Okay. Like four or five of us in like a matter of weeks. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. What's the current state of maintenance? Is the agency now still maintaining the site or have you uh, taken it over? Yeah, we have taken it over. Um, we have a pretty robust team internally. Um, so this the, the agency work was more to facilitate our concepts and ideas as opposed to like hand holding us past launch. So it's not in the slide, but one of the earliest conversations that I had with the agency was really to stop talking to us like the business side. Um, everyone on our end is technical. So getting that conversation out early enough kind of amended that relationship of them trying to over talk us into things that technically we were already savvy with. So we were just able to kind of take their documentation and figure out what our migration and what our development structure would look like. You know, from DDEV to DRush and things like that, we were able to determine from the beginning. So they kind of dealt with it how we wanted to deal with our structure and kind of how our web process worked within basically maintaining the websites. Any other do questions you, for Richard? I got one last question. Do you have just one website or do you have like a stable of websites? And so you need a, a process that's consistent across multiple websites. Yeah, we have a total of nine web properties at the moment. Um, so we started with a global one now that contains the new environment. Um, and I'm currently working on what our process would be for the next one. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at possibly a kind of three month transition between each one, knowing that I'm going to destroy and rebuild every single last one. of them. And will you go back out for rebid for each site or will you stick with this agency that did your first site? Uh, we won't need the agency past this point. So okay. we are gonna use the same code base and pretty much push that initial code base from one repository to a new branch within our um, Pantheon environment. And then we'll build it on that and then basically use that to launch the new instance of, you know, whatever new international site we'll build. Okay, thank you. No worries. Is there much content sharing between the nine different sites? Um, not much. Uh, the initial thought, I guess, and I wasn't here for that, but it, it felt like the initial thought was that they can use a set of content and kind of push it across all international web properties, where in this case, um, we're not. Um, so we, we have to take into account from a web, web flow perspective on SEO pieces, especially with like duplicate content and canonical links and things of that nature. Um, so we're kind of, we're figuring out what that looks like on the fly, knowing that we use a certain set of copy press releases and stories across all nine web properties if they're in English. Um, not so much of an issue, you know, in multilingual sites, but the English one is figuring out basically who is the parent and who is the child within, you know, trying to move the same content over. Great. Well, thank you so much, Richard. And uh, thank you, guys. Yeah, appreciate really appreciate it. the interesting presentation. And uh, thank you, everyone, for the, the good questions. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing now. All right. So sure. next up, I'm going to briefly show a slide. <laughs> uh, David's going to talk um, is talk us through a 10 minute Drupal web performance makeover, and he means 10 minutes. So let's let's see. <laughs> Cool. Great to be here. Um, yeah, I've, thank you, JD, for timing this. I've got a challenge here to take a, a normal Drupal website and in 10 minutes transform it to one of the fastest websites in the world. That's using standard Drupal modules. Uh, so let's see what we can do. Let me just grab my slides. Do you want me to start the timer already or, or will oh, we no, no, more please, 
Okay. Because yeah, okay. I've got, uh, I'm, got some about eight minutes, I'm going to explain what I'm going to do, <laughs> um, set Great. the baseline, and then we start the timer. All righty. Cool. Should we be looking at your screen? Um, I'm about to share my screen. Just give me um, one second. That screen that I was supposed to share has just disappeared. <laughs> but that's, that's not a problem. I'm just going to fire it up again. That's how screen sharing works. Yeah, let me share my screen now. Okay, I'll start. Uh, you've already heard a little bit about me. Um, I was born in India. I've, when I was 10 years old, my family moved to Australia. And um, I'm currently living in Peru with my family and we've got three kids. I'm working for a, a Christian organization, a Christian mission organization here in, in Peru. Um, you're just waiting for this slide to, to kick in. Once you can see this photo here, uh, the, the skyline of our city is dominated by this huge volcano. Uh, fortunately for us, it's only slightly active. So here we go. And it's amazing that um, we're we're almost the other side of the world, but at the, at the bottom side of the, side of the world, they were almost in exactly the same time zone. Go back one minute. Um, so this is, I'm um, married to, to Christine and we've got three kids. And that was, here's that volcano that I, I mentioned. Before having kids, we had the privilege of traveling and we had an amazing week in New York. And one of my favorite moments was dusk on the top of the Empire State Building. Now, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to chat with you guys today, but I'm also really grateful to the Drupal community. So I mentioned before that Peru was, for a short while, one of the deadliest COVID hotspots. And so our organization looked at how we could serve the most vulnerable people in our city here um, and get food to them. We started with a bunch of Excel spreadsheets to manage the logistics, and um, that just was completely unscalable. And so very quickly, I put together a Drupal website where people could register online and place themselves on a map. But within a couple of days, I realized I just could not work fast enough to build this, this application. And so I reached out to the community and some amazing developers joined, volunteered um, and joined our team. And in a short amount of time, sometimes working to 3 a.m. in the morning, we um, built a site that managed the logistics of getting food to people. And so in the six months, we were able to distribute 137 tons of food to 3,000 refugees in need. And we're also, we we're honored to be mentioned by Dries in, at the last DrupalCon at his keynote speech. I should start um, with, um, with the confession. I thought I knew something about web performance. So the last project that I, I mentioned, um, we had to design that to work on old phones with very low bandwidth. Um, and that site had um, very little JavaScript and almost no, no images. About two years ago, I also gave a chat at the Sydney Drupal meetup about how we took a site um, to, to get the, the perfect 100 Google Lighthouse score. Um, so I agreed, I, I asked, uh, I offered to do this, this talk and JD accepted. And just after that, I thought, just out of curiosity, I should run a Lighthouse test on my site again. And when the result came back, I was in shock. It was a 67. I panicked for a moment thinking, I just felt like a fraud because here I am talking about web performance and my own site is just a 67. Um, but I thought, 
let me focus on what I do know. I do know how to take a slow slide and make it much faster. And I, I do know how to improve the web performance score of, of any website. So today I can't promise to get us a, a hundred score, but I think we can take a normal Drupal site and, and dramatically improve its, its web performance. I'm um, very fortunate to have, uh, very um, fortunate that Kim um, here has offered, has volunteered her website. Um, and the website is uh, a simple, but very well built site. It's already a fast site, but we're gonna look at making it much, much faster. So um, we're, we're only gonna focus on a couple of metrics. So last week with Ben's talk, he mentioned these three things, largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative lay layout shift. But we're just gonna focus on the largest contentful paint and the Google Lighthouse score, which kind of gives you an overall picture, a score between zero and 100 based on quite a few metrics. And I might also mention, we're just gonna focus on performance. Perform performance is based on seconds, while scalability is based on how many requests per minute, or requests per second a server can, uh, can respond with. And also we're gonna focus on front end because front end is where you can make the biggest performance improvement. So for example, if you look at this, um, this waterfall chart, the website loading, you can see this little part is the server time to respond. And this large part is where the browser is downloading resources and rendering it. So if you have a look at, compare the server, server with, with the front end performance, the front end is where you can make the biggest difference. Of course, you wanna make an impact on both, but the front end is where you make the biggest difference. So just 10 minutes, um, because time is so critical in this presentation, um, I've had to cheat. So I'm sorry about that, but, but I timed Composer, for example, um, takes sometimes up to a minute to install a module, web, test, web page test also takes a minute. So um, I've had to simplify things a little bit to be able to, to do this quickly. Okay, so let's have a look at this website. Now, even in Peru, this website already loads fairly quickly. It's a simple site, um, but it's got all the functionality that we need. We've got views here um, and we've got content under here that we're not gonna drill, drill down into. I just focused on two different pages, the, the home page that's got a large hero image and this particular page that's got um, a, a list of images. And so the first thing we can do, and now I'll ask JD to get his, his stopwatch ready. Don't start it yet, because let's have a look at the, the current performance of, of the website. So the website currently loads in just over two seconds, and it's got a Google Lighthouse score of, of 38. And this is in development. Just having a quick look at the chart, we can immediately see these little tails um, in the chart that give away that it's HTTP one. Um, we know that when this is put in production, it, it'll use HTTP two. HTTP two. Um, so we know that in production, the website will be faster than it is, is at the moment. So JD, are we ready? I'm ready. Cool, let's go. So the first, uh, the first thing I'll do is I will um, check the configuration, go into development performance. And we're going to turn on the standard Drupal caching. Drupal 8 is fantastic when it comes to uh, out of the box performance functionality. So let me enable, enable these. Save that. Normally I'd, I'd, I'd refresh the cache and then run our Google page test. You can see now the Lighthouse score has immediately gone up. We were at 38, we've gone up to 55. 
and our largest contentful paint has gone down from a bit over two minutes, sorry, two seconds to 1.6 seconds. So if we, have, if we have a look at what we've just done, we set a baseline, we've enabled the core performance feature, and we've been able to take the site from uh, 38 to 55. Um, and this is the largest contentful paint, which is measured in, in seconds. And we've had a significant performance boost. The next thing we're gonna do is install the um, add badge module, advanced aggregation module. Back to the site. We'll We'll find the, the advanced aggregation modules. I'm gonna ins install the, the modifier, minifying the JavaScript CSS. Many of these, the other ones aren't relevant for us at the moment. For example, we're not interested in Internet Explorer. Um, we're happy that with the default way that uh, this module is gonna aggregate, aggregate bundles. Great, go into the configuration. I'm gonna accept basically all the, the default options. So DNS, DNS prefetch means that if we're getting fonts, I know that we're getting fonts from Google, this will do a prefetch, um, uh, will request a uh, prefetch of the DNS so when we do request this request in the, in the HTML, that will come through more quickly. I'm gonna accept the normal level of, of aggregation here. Normal cache levels and hit save. I will ignore information. Um, there's nothing we need to look at in then operations as well. Let me go into C CSS minification. I'm happy with the, the default option here. I'll go to Java, JavaScript minification and choose JS squeeze. I'll go into modifications. Actually, I'll make sure that I've saved that. Right. Modifications. There are a lot of options here and there's a lot of options that will break your site. So uh, enable pre-process -pre -pre on all JavaScript. So module owners can choose not to include their JavaScript file into a bundle. And you would assume they have a good reason for doing that, um, but this will override those. Um, this is also an interesting one where it adds the defer tag to, to JavaScript, which means that the browser will only load, um, load the, the, this JavaScript file at the very end. Um, I have already tried that and I know that 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 breaks parts of the site, so I'll leave that alone. And I will accept, um, I will ac accept yeah, the defaults just as they are. And normally I will flush, I would flush the cache and go back to the site. And let's have a look at the web page results for this one. So our lighthouse score again has gone up. Um, if you can remember what it was before, we were at 55 and we've pushed it to 60. And we've got a, again, a performance boost. Uh, David, it sounds like your audio just cut out a little bit. Maybe you hit oh. something. You're good oh. now. Cool, thank you. I've just got to watch where I put my hand. <laughs> my hand. And you're, at, uh, you're halfway now. Okay, oh, great, thank you. Um, so let's go back. So we've just installed the AdVadge module. Um, we've pushed our Lighthouse score up to 60, which is great. We've only crept, the speed improvement has just been tiny, but often with performance, um, even a small improvement is great. Have, installing the module was very simple. Let me go, our next uh, module is lazy loading. The great news is that if you're using 9.1 or above, this, is, uh, this comes default with um, with Drupal core. So let me head back and we enable this module. For lazy. 
And at the end of this, I'll post in the chat, uh, in Slack, the modules that I've used along with the links. Four minutes remaining. Oh, okay, let's go to uh, the configuration, which is in a very unusual place in the content authoring. I'll enable that, enable those. So um, this is useful for views. I'll go into the lazy configuration and I'll change the throttle delay to the minimum, which is 66 milliseconds. Save that. And while that saves, because we're so short of time, this was a, um, a huge surprise to me because instead of our, our lighthouse score going up, our lighthouse score went down. But in, um, we look at our largest contentful paint it's gone down to 0.688. So if you remember what we had before, let's look at our, our chart. We look at, we've got lazy loading. Three minutes. So Lighthouse has gone down, but our, our speed, oops. Lighthouse has gone down, but our speed, we've actually more than halved the speed, our load speed of the site. Sometimes there's a bit, there's a bit of a trade-off. Um, but this has made the, the most massive difference, even greater than the core location. So image optimization, I looked at the main, I looked at the main um, hero image on our site and I downloaded the image and used squish.app, which is an app that Ben mentioned last week. And I was able to take that, that image down from um, 500k to just 37k and we'd expect that to make a, a big difference we have more than hard the the page size two so minutes two minutes and that has made a huge difference to the lighthouse um, performance score our content uh, largest contentful paint hasn't changed that dramatically Let's have a look at the results here. So that has given us a great score. Um, it hasn't actually changed our load speed that significantly. And if anyone has a question about this, we can look at it later. The last module I'm going to look at is called Faster Web. This is the module that I developed. And it's in beta at the moment. So I'll go to extend. I'll enable the module. While that's happening, let me open the, um, the, the website in incognito. Oh. <laughs> you set yourself a, a yes. tough Yes, I'm almost there. Now what this module does is changes a Drupal site into an SDA. So, Subsequent loads are instant. I don't know if you can see this, but if you try this on your mobile, uh, any page load is now instant. We can see in our, on the console, I've, uh, we're in, in debug mode. We're prefetching the most likely links that you'll, you, you will click on. And when you click on those, if you happen to click on a, on a link that is predicted, it opens, for example, in 34 milliseconds. So, and this is most remarkable on mobile. If we look back at our, our chart here, um, unfortunately, we it does not affect our first page load. It's it, what it does change is our subsequent page loads, um, and we can see that um, we can measure the time it takes to, to change to change pages. We're in overtime, but that's okay. Oh, okay, and that's it. So um, I'll just give a quick summary of what we've done. You, you've got, um, you can have more time if you want, David. That was, that was your own uh, constraint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I love these challenges where I give myself a short amount of time to do, uh, to do something. Uh, what I hope it does is show that to dramatically improve the speed of your site, you don't need days, weeks of development. The community has, has built some fantastic tools that we can use. And it's just a matter of installing and configuring them. Configuring them. 
Um, because of the short amount of time, I didn't get to, to look at other modules, um, but there are some other very interesting modules. Responsive images, this is actually a fantastic module that takes a long time to, to set up because you, you, um, you have breakpoints. So um, but for desktop, tablets, phone, et cetera, and you can have different size images for each of those. Um, I won't talk about each of these, but they, these uh, are, a very interesting module. Progressive Web App is a very interesting module because it doesn't help so much with performance, but uh, you just turn it on and your website works offline. Some other, uh, so I'll just quickly mention um, some other tools. Unused CSS, if you're desperate to get your website load time down, you could use this tool um, where it will actually, for example, with this website, it identified that you just need 72, oh, it was able to cut out 72% of the, uh, the CSS. And you can do things with your CDN as well if you're desperate to improve performance. Um, so finishing off, I think Drupal performance should never be a, a reason, a performance should never be a reason to migrate away from Drupal. I've heard conversations with Sometimes I'm speaking with, with clients and they're talking about moving away from Drupal to React or Gatsby or Next.js. Uh, performance should never be a reason to move away from Drupal because with the right configuration, Drupal can be fa as fast, and in some cases with a faster web module, faster than, than React. I love React. Um, we're using React as an app inside some of our applications where it's most suited, but Drupal with certain modules and the configuration is incredibly fast. So thank you very much. Um, oh, I should finish off by saying we've taken a website that loaded in 2.26 seconds and it now loads, it's the fastest configuration was in 0.7 of a second. And that puts it in the top 3% of, of websites. Uh, while I let this load um, while we ask questions. David, how do you get the um, White House to show up on, on web page um, web page test? Good question. If when you load up um, web page test, if you go to the easy tab, it does it for you automatically. The easy tab. Yes. Uh, the the other option is where you actually select that on uh, on the advanced section. So let me let me do that here. I'll open up web page test, go back to home. Okay. For all of these tests, I just used um, simple test and the, the URL is slash easy. But on the, uh, if you go back to advanced, um, you've still got. To the Chromium tab. And one of the, under one of these options. Chromium tab. It's a Chromium okay. tab. And the yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. For all these tests, though, I just use it, the, the simple test. Cool, good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, um, my name is Quinn, and um, I just have three questions. I hope I don't get too much. <laughs> so no, the, first quest, the first question is, uh, will the slideshow will be available? Yes, so I will share the, the, the slideshow, and I've also made just a, a one page summary of the talk so that you with links to each of the modules. So um, it's easy to reproduce what I've done. Okay, and thank I, you. Um, the second question is if I have only one choice, uh, either web page test or Lighthouse, which one would you recommend? Okay, web page test actually can include Lighthouse and it gives you a lot more detail. So, Lighthouse is use, useful for giving you one number. So if you're working with a team, you can rally around um, just one number. Um, but I think you need web page tests to be able to drill down into why something is happening. And so each oh. site's quite different. So um, you would have seen that in some of the modules I, I installed made very little difference. For example, uh, the advanced aggregation Normally, for a site with a lot of JavaScript, that makes a huge, huge difference. 
uh, and looking at web page tests, you can you can see which modules would be more, most important for your site. I see. Hi. Um, yeah, this makes sense. Thanks. Um, the last question is, um, I missed the part when you said um, one of the settings in the events, uh, um, events, what, what is the module name again? Events aggregation. Yes, event aggregation could break the site. Um, do you remember by any chance? <laughs> yes. Actually, there's lots of settings in there that will, that will break your site. Oh, um, okay. The way JavaScript is written, let me share my screen again. Often when we write JavaScript, we don't think too carefully about uh, asynchronous, asynchronous loading of JavaScript. So a script might rely on other scripts. And so normally in, in Drupal, you can set the weight. So some JavaScript files load before others. But if you go into, into the settings, and can you see my screen? Yes. Great. And if I go back into development performance, uh, advanced aggregation, and we look at modifications. Um, so this one will break some sites. Mm -hmm. This one will break uh, most sites. For example, this one will break your, your toolbar. So this, this adds to JavaScript, the defer tag, which means that any weights that the developer has set in, uh, in their modules to mm -hmm. JavaScript files, um, to get the JavaScript files to load in a certain order will be broken. And the browser will decide which order to load the JavaScript files in. If I save that, you'll, you will see that on, for the site for anonymous users, it actually doesn't affect it doesn't affect the site. But now my toolbar doesn't work. Oh, I see. Cool. All right, that's Thank all you. I have. Thank you. Does anyone have an idea of like some kind of module that transforms JPEGs and stuff to like WebP? Like, does that exist in Drupal? Yeah. Does it? So, does it work though? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that it, the, the module I, I tried was the AVIF module. So WebP has reasonable U coverage in different browsers, mm -hmm. um, but the benefit is not that great compared to, uh, to a well-optimized JPEG. Uh, AVIF, um, last week, Ben talked about this new format and AVIF format is really promising. When I tested out the AVIF module, I couldn't, I couldn't get it to work, but it's, it's a complicated module to work because it in, integrates with, um, with Drupal's core response, responsive image module. Um, and I checked the HTML and it looked okay, but the, the files that are generated looked exactly the same. The size difference wasn't what I expected. But yes, we should be able to do that out of the box. Um, because now what I do is, I, I don't have time to use squish for each file. So I've got an NPM package um, called image min that I can run. If, so, if a client gives me a bunch of files, I can run that on all the files with the same configuration. But yeah, that, that should be built into Drupal. And I think I should test those module, modules. I shouldn't complain about a module when I don't fully understand it. Do you have any idea if, if Squish has some kind of API or something that you could probably use during the upload of an image? I believe so. I should check that out. It's, it's open source. And I love the actual interface that you use because it uses WebAssembly. So you don't actually have mm -hmm. to upload anything to the server. But I believe they also have an API. OK, that's cool. There's, there's a model for that, but not for Squish. I think it's for TinyPNG. I think I've seen it that okay. pass everything through, through them. But that will be interesting to have. I'll take a look. Cool. And before, I don't know if I have another question, but I, ha I have an ask before we go. And I just share my screen, uh, screen again. Uh, I've done this for just one site and have measured how different modules have affected 
performance. I'd really like to understand when n equals one, it's, it's never a good uh, scientific experiment. I'd love to, to try it. I've tried it with, I've done this with several of my own websites, but I'd love to do this on a slightly bigger scale um, and actually publish this to the document, the Drupal documentation. So um, if you have um, 40 minutes at uh, one lunchtime, um, please drop me a note. I'll, I'll leave my email address here. I've got an email, david at fasterweb.io. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd love to help you speed up your website. Um, and hopefully you're willing to share this information um, with the community so that we can have a very clear indication of what different modules do and roughly an idea of what kind of benefit that, that will give you. Looks like Ralph's got a question. And just more, more in addition in regards of the idea, um, in the advanced testing on web page test, you have the opportunity to uh, set up the number of tests to run. And I don't remember in the Christmas calendar, the performance calendar about three or four years ago, there was an article about runs necessary to get the uh, medium or mean um, performance of a page. And uh, the, the recommendation was around six or seven rounds and with first view and repeated view to aggregate. And that way you get a more um, average uh, result of an yes. actual page. Absolutely. And I another, and just one other slight addition, uh, in the advanced testing, you have also the opportunity to choose uh, on the test location, if you go to DAO, you have the opportunity to uh, choose real uh, devices. And for example, if you take the Moto Motorola G generation four, you have um, an average device, which uh, is more usual and has more issues dealing with a large JavaScript, for example. And then you get a better impression for the average user, uh, what the perception is, then if you go with cable and um, a desktop device. And if you take a Moto G4 and for example, slow G4, uh, 3G, um, then you get a more real life idea how your page and the performance is perceived. Thank you, Ralph, absolutely. That's very true. All right, well, David, thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, good techniques and uh, Sparked a lot of uh, a lot of good questions. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll we'll move on to our final speaker of the evening. If I can find my share button here, <laughs> Diego is going to talk to us about building a high availability environment for Drupal with Microsoft Azure. Over to you. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so I was asking if you can see my screen. Looking good, Diego. OK, perfect. OK, so I'll start. Um, so first of all, I'm going to present myself again. Um, so I am Diego Tejera. I am the CTO of Rootstack. Um, we are a Drupal, not, not, not just a Drupal, a, a software agency based in in Panama, uh, but we also have offices in, in Colombia and, and some remote guys in Latin America. Um, I've been doing software for, for more than 12 years. Um, and I have, uh, I, ha I have worked as a software developer, a DevOps engineer, a product manager, a project manager. So being in an agency, uh, I've been through, through a lot of roles. Um, right now I'm working as a CTO, um, and I've been working with Drupal for probably more than 10 years now. Okay, so a little bit about um, 
the agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what is Microsoft Azure in, in case someone does not know. Um, why I decided to try to put a, a Drupal here. And then after that, I will talk about uh, what services we can use and a little bit of how we can configure them. And after that, a little bit of a demonstration. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, uh, Microsoft Azure is basically the cloud services that Microsoft provides to, to uh, as a cloud solution uh, like AWS or, or Google Cloud, right? Um, and they have uh, a huge amount of products uh, to use. Uh, they're mostly known for, for stuff related to, to, to Microsoft, but uh, they've been pretty good uh, on the last years, uh, making it available for, for other stuff. Okay, so the next question is why did I do this? Uh, we have so many great uh, platforms uh, specialized on Drupal uh, uh, to, to put our websites. And if not, uh, there's a bunch of documentation to, to do this kind of, uh, this kind of stuff on, on, on services like Amazon. So why did I do this? Um, the first thing, and this is the reason why, um, we have clients here in Latin America that have worked all of their life just using Microsoft products. Um, and when we started to work with them, and this, ha this has happened more than once, uh, we, 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 we were able to convince them to use Drupal for the website, uh, but they did not want to get out of, of Microsoft uh, tools, okay? So, because of that, that's what I started to use um, for some for some of some of the websites that we managed, uh, Azure. Okay, and so the, the main two things that that we did that was uh, because our clients were used to Microsoft tools and they wanted also to keep everything in one place. They already have a bunch of systems working there, so they wanted to keep everything there. Um, and what I discovered doing this is that it's actually pretty easy. And, and it's good. It's it's not. It's it's pretty good. They have a, a bunch of tools that you can use now to to set up your environments there, and, and actually have a pretty decent uh, uh, infrastructure in in uh, with, with high availability on your website. Okay. So, what will we need to do this? Um, the first service that I use for this is one called Azure App Service, uh, which is basically a managed service that, that Azure has to put uh, your apps there uh, where you can uh, deploy uh, apps uh, or even containers there. Okay, so some of the characteristics of, of Azure App Service is you can bring your code and use uh, some, some of the different environments that they offer there, or just bring your own container, your Docker container. Um, they take care in case you use the, the provided environments that they have. Uh, they take care of, of the security and patching and like other managed uh, platforms. And you can easily integrate that with some CI tools and it has out of the box integration with GitHub and GitHub Actions. And, Azure DevOps, of course, and, and Docker Hub. Um, and the other neat thing about it is that you can really easily scale it up or out, depending on what you need. And it has a bunch of monitoring tools. OK, so this is basically where your code is going to live or what it's going to serve your, your uh, yeah, the web and, and act, act as a web server, right? So let's let's take a look of this. And this is just gonna be like an overview so you can see what you can have here. Um, so what I have here is, I don't know if you can see it or if it's too small, I'm gonna try to make it a little bit bigger. Um, this, is, this is basically um, uh, the Azure interface. And one of the services that they have is app services, right? In which I have one website here, actually two running that I did uh, for, for this talk. Um, and the one that I'm gonna be showing is this one that says Camp Drupal site. So 
This website lives inside something called an Azure service plan. Uh, sorry, yeah, an app service plan, which is this. And in the app service plan, you can configure stuff uh, like uh, which, um, uh, which size of machines uh, you wanna have here. Uh, you can configure uh, rules to scale up or scale out uh, your, your infrastructure. And it's pretty easy to do it. You even have a UI to do this. Although you have a pretty complete uh, set of, of commands that you can use for this. But right now uh, I'm using like a, a base plan for this test and they only offer on the base plans like a manual scale. So I can come here and, and manually just uh, tell uh, that, that just uh, uh, spin up three instances of of the size of the instance that I have right now. Uh, but if you use the other plans that they have, you can create rules, automation rules, just to scale this up or out depending on the traffic or or the date or something like that. So it, it's pretty pretty easy to manage this here, and you can configure stuff like auto healing and, and have these uh, across different regions and stuff like that. So that's that's uh, something that makes the site pretty pretty easy to manage in this regard. So and, and inside the Azure App Service itself, which lives inside that configuration, you can you can have other stuff here. Um, you can take a look at uh, activity logs, which everything that has happened uh, into it. Uh, you can uh, set up some some authentication system here. Um, and you can have something called deployment slots, which will help you to have, uh, let's say different environments running. Uh, let's say you have a stage environment, you can set up that as a deployment slot here. Um, and you can also set uh, variables that you can use under environments. That is what I have here. So for example, for my Drupal uh, website, uh, this is where I have uh, the credentials for the database. Um, and I, you can set up all the stuff that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and yeah, you can set, set up all the rules here if you want to override those on the plan. And yeah, there's, there's some other stuff here, but you have here some a log stream, but you can see stuff that happens on, on your instances. And yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it in terms of the import, most important stuff that you have here. There, there's a bunch of more stuff here, uh, but that would probably give you a good idea of what you can have with this. Um, you can also set up, um, and I can actually show that, um, if you create a new app, As I mentioned before, um, you can publish just code on a runtime stack that they already have, or you can set up this using a Docker container and, and use your own Docker container if you have uh, special configurations or anything that, that it's not here. But for the website that I have here, I am simply using uh, one of the runtime stacks and I selected PHP 7.4. And with that, I was able to accomplish uh, having uh, a Drupal website working with uh, everything that you need for, for Drupal. Okay. So let's get out of here for now and go back to the presentation. Um, the next thing that I use here is basically a service called Azure Database for MySQL, which is also a managed service that they have. This time is uh, MySQL database. And with this, you can easily set up, um, uh, you can do redundancy here. You can also do auto scaling on your database. Says, and it, it, it has a pretty neat tool to manage your, your, your security on it and it gives you some, some pretty cool reports. Um, and they also have, I haven't, actually uses this, but, uh, and this is probably 
part of their marketing team that say that they use uh, AI to, to give you some performance recommendations. Um, but they have, they have this uh, place where you can see uh, recommendations that they give you based in slow queries and or stuff that's been called a lot uh, or stuff like that. So it, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and it's pretty easy to configure also. Okay, and there are some other, let's say, optional services that you could use uh, for your website. Um, you could use Redis if you need it, and they have a managed Redis uh, service. You can use their CDN uh, if you want to, to serve uh, your assets. And this one actually, uh, you should use it. Uh, it's it's uh, something like Amazon S3 to store your, your files. So instead of using uh, the, the files folder that will be on your container, you should be using this. And there's a Drupal module to automatically connect with the Azure Blob Storage service and just put your files there. Um, and you can also use, this is their logo for virtual machines. Um, so you can also use uh, their normal virtual machines to set up uh, a varnish cluster and have them in front of, of your app services. So a whole uh, environment will probably look like this. You will have your Azure VMs with a varnish cluster in front. Um, after that, you will have uh, your app services, which will be serving your website and you will have your code there. And you can set up these auto scaling groups in case you need you you have more traffic. You can make it uh, bigger or slow or or smaller. And your ready service here, also your MySQL database, of course. And you will have your data or files on the Azure Storage service. Okay. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, so how, sh how can we do this? Um, so basically the things that we need to create on Azure um, are the ones that I have here. Um, the first thing you need to create is a resource group. Um, they call a resource group like a, a, a group of, of, of services that you have and you can put everything under this. So your database will live on the same, should live on the same resource group as your app service and your storage. So you will have like everything grouped there. Um, after that, you will need to create an app service plan where you will uh, set up uh, basically uh, what kind of machine do you want those containers to run on if you will have the, the scaling rules there. Um, and you will also need to create after that the app itself, which is where you will put uh, that you're going to use their PHP 7.4 runtime stack. Um, then you can set up your app settings, which is what we saw that has your username and password and everything uh, on, on, on their platform. And then we can create the database using also their tools. And after that, obviously setting up your deployment scripts to deploy everything uh, to those environments. Um, so um, I'm gonna show you one that I have here and how easy this was. Um, so after uh, setting up that, um, where is it? I think I closed it. Yeah, after setting up my app service, uh, which is this website, um, you can select uh, different ways to deploy this website. Um, and that's here on the deployment center. For, for this website, I have the simplest uh, way of deploying this, which is basically something they call a Drupal, uh, sorry, a local kit. And what they do is that they give you this uh, 
a Git uh, remote that you can push your code to. So whenever you push your code there, that's gonna, uh, out of the box, it's gonna run Composer install, or it's gonna try to run Composer install on your website because you selected the runtime stack PHP. Um, and you can set up besides that some uh, before and post uh, composed uh, job uh, jobs. Yeah, so, so you can set up your own uh, stuff that can run after that. And this is the simplest way to do it, uh, but you can also uh, use GitHub Actions and have everything there and compile everything outside of, 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 of Azure and then just push stuff uh, ready for your website. So, but this, this was good enough for what I needed uh, because I just need to run Composer install. And if I have, let's say uh, a team I need uh, with, with that is using Node, uh, I need to, if I need to run NPM install and then maybe uh, NPM run build or something like that to build my CSS files and all of that, I can do it with this without using anything else. Uh, because this, this also, this runtime stack also comes with Node. So you can just use it. Um, and the way to do that is um, basically uh, setting up on your configuration one uh, variable called post build command. In here, you will just set up what do you want that to run. In my case, I just uh, did a simple uh, bash script uh, that it's called buildteam.sh. Okay, and that's here. Um, let me show you. You, it, it's a pretty simple script. The only thing that I did just for this, uh, just to show it on 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 this demo was just uh, printing the node version that the container has. Nothing else, um, because it's just just for testing and to show you that this runs. And so. Um, I'm still using for this a normal Git repository. Um, so um, what I did here, sorry, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm already uh, showing my whole screen. What I did here was uh, create a really simple GitHub action uh, to just push the code to Azure when I push the code to GitHub. So let me show you how that looks again. And that's this simple GitHub action that I have here. Um, the only thing that I'm doing here is basically setting up my credentials, checking out master from the repository itself, and then pushing uh, the code to Azure. And something that you will notice here is there, this, this method that they have does not support using an SSH key for some reason. So what I did is that I stored the password they provided me into uh, the Azure, the, sorry, GitHub secret keys. Uh, so I'm just doing an HTTPS push uh, once I push to, to GitHub, okay? So let's make a quick test. So let me open my whole screen again. And I'm gonna open here my command line and make a simple, pretty simple uh, change. I'm just going to, I don't know, uh, create a file here. Okay, so I created that. And once I push this to GitHub, this will trigger the action that I have there. And let's go to my GitHub repository. And now we have this. this job running here. And the only thing that is doing on Azure, um, on GitHub is simply 
put in the code. So once that happened, and what you're seeing here right now, this is this is not running on everything that says remote. This is not running on 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 GitHub Actions. This is already running on on Azure. So they they, as I said, they automatically run Composer install over what you have there, and it it is right now it's building the whole project, right? Is that only for pushing a master or can you create no, like no. different branches in there? You, you can create different bunch branches um, and you can do that using the deployment slots. So you can have different branches on different environments. Uh, I just did it this way uh, because it was simpler for this quick uh, demonstration. Gotcha. Right? That's cool. And again, you can use their deployment uh, uh, platform, their, their build platform inside Azure, which is what I'm doing here. Um, or you can set up your own outside and do everything and then just push your, your completed uh, uh, build. So yeah, this might take a couple of minutes. That is why David didn't do this on his, 10 minute run, um, but yeah, this is this is running um, Composer install and once it's finished, it's gonna copy the build to the folder that we have on the website. And deploy it, if, if we have a cluster, it's gonna put it on all of the containers that we have or instances that we have running. Hey Diego, uh, why, do you yeah. prefer, why do you prefer running Composer um, on Azure rather than in GitHub Actions? Um, I don't. Um, it, it really, it's, I guess it's a matter of preference. Um, what I wanted to show here is how easy it was to do it without you having to configure everything on, on your actions. Uh, because out of the box, you can just push the code it, and it's going to do it. But it probably makes more sense if you want to have more control to do the stuff on your, on your site and not, not there. Thanks. Okay. And I think it finished. So the only thing that I want to show is after it finished running everything in there, there's, let me see where it finished. Yeah, here, it printed uh, my, my node version, uh, which was executing that post build uh, deploy, uh, SH file that I have there. Um, so th yeah, this gives you the flexibility to do it there or do it on your side and then push it. Actually, if I change and let me go back to, to the website, if I go to the deployment center, and I go to settings, Let me see if I can change. Yeah, I, I can change uh, uh, the way it gets deployed and pushed here. So yeah, you have you have many options, and there's there's a lot of documentation about how to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. If if you don't want to use that uh, simple git push, you can connect it to other other stuff here. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty much it here. Um, something that I found interesting is that uh, while I was looking on how to do it, uh, I found a couple of uh, tutorials and even a video from from I think Drupalcon 2019, but it was not too much information or uh, incomplete. So I'm planning on 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 writing a, a blog post with basically everything that you need to do in detail. I actually, while I, while I was doing this, this uh, pre preparing this talk, I took notes of every command that I did to, to make this work. 
So I'm planning on sharing that. So, so it's available for anyone who will be in the need for doing this. Okay, so let me go back to my uh, slides and I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Diego. Questions for Diego? Did you find any advantages to using um, as your over other platforms, like maybe having multiple, be able to have multiple instances at the same time, anything that was actually easier on Azure? Um, I felt that doing that here uh, was a little bit easier than doing it, uh, for example, in AWS. Um, for the first time, because when you, we, are, we are familiar with it, uh, it gets easier, but I found it easier here uh, to configure it, but I felt that, that there is a little bit less flexibility on the way you could do stuff here compared to, for example, using yeah, AWS for this. Thanks. Do you always use like the, the, the out of the box PHP seven or do you guys like, do you have like a, a preset, con like a preset Docker container that you guys use for your websites? Like, do you find that okay. it would be easier instead of like out the box or is it maybe harder to maintain? No, it's not. Um, I, I, I'm not maintaining that on our company right now, but I think we're using one that it, we have published on Docker Hub that we use for, for that. And sometimes you need weird libraries and stuff like that. So sometimes you need to use your own. Are there any advantages in terms of scalability? Like if you were doing something that, you know, usually is a pretty quiet site, but you're selling tickets for a concert or something like that? And you need, you know, more, more power. Well, yeah, you can you can on on the app services and also on on the MySQL services. Uh, you can set up uh, auto scaling rules uh, based on the load that you have on your servers, and you can also schedule that if you're expecting something and you don't want to to wait for for the load to come. But it's it's pretty easy to set up. Uh, those, those scale, they, they have scale up and scale out rules. So you can just increase the size of the machine that you're using or spin up more machines and, and it's gonna go down once the load goes down. And it's it's pretty easy to use. Um, I don't have it here because I'm using this uh, test um, test plan uh, that, I, that I put there, but if, if you go to higher tiers uh, on the scale out rules, um, instead of manually just setting up how many instances you want to have, uh, you can set up those rules and, and do it based on, on load or time to go up or down. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Diego, and, and uh, all our speakers tonight. I'm going to switch back over to our slides for our closing slides. Or at least I'm going to say that's what I'm going to do. Here we go. Okay, so um, our next meetups, uh, we've got our first lunch and learn on Tuesday, March 16th at noon Eastern time. And uh, then on April 7th, uh, 6 p.m. is our evening meetup. And uh, links to register will be distributed uh, via our mailing list. And there's a link now to that at drupalnyc.org um, if you are not joined up uh, on that and also uh, will be announced in Slack. Uh, and yes, we, we don't have speakers for these next uh, meetups yet. So uh, we do need uh, volunteers. So if anybody out there is been thinking about presenting. It can be short, it can be long. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Speak at drupalnyc.org.
And if you want to help organize as well, we'd love to have you. Ramona's not that young anymore. <laughs> All right, that's it. Um, so uh, that's the end of our, our programming for the night. Um, I'm going to turn off the recording and uh, feel free to hang out and socialize and uh, uh, ask more questions. Thanks, everyone, for joining.